Well, um, it's been a privilege. Uh, Bruce Chapman introduced me to Father Spitzer a oh, year and a half, two years ago, and uh, we got to talking about the, these topics, and I, I, he invited me to contribute uh, an appendix to one of the chapters in his book, uh, and uh, I was grateful for that opportunity. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure getting to know Father Spitzer uh, over the last year and a half or so. So um, you've been introduced to the... Uh, seemingly irrefutable fact that the universe has a beginning. And that doesn't matter whether you have classical Big Bang cosmology or you embrace uh, an inflationary model. If you've got an average Hubble expansion that's greater than zero, the universe has a beginning. But that beginning was very special. And you saw some of that uh, indicated in Father Spitzer's discussion of, of entropy. So you might say we live in the Goldilocks universe. Uh, you know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears and the porridge that wasn't uh, too hot, and wasn't too cold, it was just right. Well, that's the kind of universe that we inhabit. And in particular, it's just right with respect to the initial conditions and just right with respect to the natural laws and constants. And let me just um, emphasize a little bit uh, more about the initial conditions. What is an initial condition? Well, suppose I was going to throw a baseball to you. If I didn't give it enough oomph, it wouldn't reach you. And if I threw it too hard, it might hurt you. So uh, if, if it's going to arrive and it's going to be a comfortable catch, uh, I've got to impart just the right sort of, of impetus to it. So that would be an, an example of an initial condition. Now, our universe, um, you could talk about it as kind of beginning in an explosion. Now, an explosion you think of as kind of a messy event. And this is the <laughs> point about entropy. The explosion in which our universe began was not a messy event. Um, and if you talk about the, uh, how messy it could have been, this is what the Penrose calculation is all about, essentially. It looks at the uh, observed statistical entropy in our universe, the, the entropy per baryon, and he calculates that out, and he arrives at a certain figure. And then he calculates, using the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for black hole entropy, um, what the supermassive black hole, the singularity that, that would have constituted the beginning of the universe, what sort of entropy could have been associated with that? And so you've got the numerator, the observed entropy, and the denominator, how big it could have been. And that fraction turns out to be, as Father Fitz Spitzer said, 1 over 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. Uh, let me just emphasize how big that denominator is so that you can uh, gain a real appreciation of how uh, small that probability is. So there are 10 to the 80th baryons in the universe, protons and, and neutrons. Now suppose we put a zero on every one of those, okay? How many zeros is that? That's 10 to the 80th zeros. This number has 10 to the 123rd zeros, okay? So you would need 100 million, trillion, trillion, trillion universes our size with a zero on every proton and neutron in all of those universes just to write out this number. That's how fine-tuned the initial entropy of our universe is. And as Father Fitz Spitzer said, if, if there were, was a pre-Big Bang state uh, and, and you uh, have some bounces, uh, that fine-tuning gets even finer uh, as you go backward. <laughs> If, if you can even imagine such a thing. So that, that's the fine-tuning of the initial conditions that we observe. There's another kind of fine-tuning that's characteristic of the natural laws and constants in our universe. If we didn't have the right laws, our universe wouldn't be stable. So for instance, if gravity were an inverse cube law instead of an inverse square law, uh, the planetary air orbits wouldn't be stable, everything would spiral in, and, and life wouldn't be possible. So you need the right laws. And, uh, you know, laws could mathematically, just from a, an abstract point of view, have taken many forms, but they have a particular form, and is that particular form that makes the universe possible. Secondly, what about constants? Well, Father Spitzer mentioned um, gravity. Okay. Uh, it is indeed very fine-tuned. If you look at the scale of the strengths of physical forces, it varies over 40 orders of magnitude. The weakest is the gravitational force, the strongest is the strong nuclear force in uh, the nucleus of the atom, which is 40 orders of magnitude. That's 10 to the 40th times stronger than the gravitational force. 
Now, there's no intrinsic reason in physical theory why the constants have the values that they have. Uh, they're measured empirically to have that value. Newton's mm -hmm. constant is empirically determined. So if you ask, well, how wide could it have varied? How much could it have varied? Well, the range of strengths of physical forces that we observe uh, would be a, a reasonable uh, range to consider. So consider what would um, be the case if gravity could have varied over that um, scale. And what we see then as a consequence is that gravity is fine-tuned to uh, relative to the range of strengths of physical forces to about one part in 10 to the 40th. Uh, to illustrate that, suppose that, to be generous, that the universe is 30 billion light years uh, across the observable universe, and we stretch a tape measure across that, okay? <laughs> that comes out to about 10 to the 28th inches. Now, peg Newton's constant on one of those inches, okay? It, it's, it's here in the middle, and, and the tape measure stretches off uh, into the distance either way across the, the width of the observable universe, all right? Now, what would be the consequence of moving that um, Newton's constant, say, one inch to the right or one inch to the left? Well, 10 to the 40th divided by 10 to the 28th is 10 to the 12th. So, with respect to the width of the whole universe, moving it one inch this way would increase the force of gravity a trillion fold or decrease it a trillion fold. Uh, if uh, you decrease it a trillion fold, no structures of any consequence <laughs> are going to form. And if you increase it a trillion fold, even Weight Watchers isn't going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there wouldn't be any you to weigh that much, in other words. So, um, here's another example. The cosmological constant is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th power. Uh, and what the cosmological constant does is it governs the rate of the expansion of space itself. Now, uh, for years it was thought to be zero, uh, but it turns out that it has a very small positive value. This was discovered back in 1998, and it falls within this constraint. If it were any larger, space would be blowing apart so fast that, again, you wouldn't get any structures. And if it were any smaller, the universe would recollapse on itself. So that's fine-tuned to 1 in 10 to the 120th. Those are two examples of the constants of nature that are also fine-tuned. So how are you going to explain this away um, if you want to try to preclude the possibility of uh, an intelligent transcendent agent who injected this information into the universe in a highly specific way? Well, what you're going to do uh, Incidentally, this, this is kind of the, the illustration of Love it. a universe creating machine. You've got to set all the dials just right, or you don't get a universe that's compatible with life. OK. How can you get multiple tries at um, different initial conditions for the universe? Well, inflationary cosmology is something that can give you that. What is inflationary cosmology? It's the idea that a split second after the Big Bang, the universe went underwent a period of hyper-exponential expansion uh, that then shut off, and, and then the expansion continued at the more, uh, the more sedate rate that we see today. Why was this initially proposed? Well, it was initially proposed to explain away certain features of the universe that are, are, are rather puzzling. The uniformity of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the fact that the, uh, the observable universe is uh, almost flat uh, in uh, terms of its, its geometry. Uh, it, it has some properties of uniformity that, that are unusual. And inflation was invoked to kind of smooth things out in an initial stage so that when things blew up to be larger, they'd still be smooth. That is the essential idea. Um, so what you've got then is a picture of, say, our visible universe here is, is in a larger bubble uh, that was a result of the original uh, inflation. And then prior to that, maybe there was another uh, inflationary period that preceded it. And so you get uh, the universe is a series of, of nested bubbles, is the idea. And that process, um, called chaotic inflation, which was uh, described by Andre Lind, if it existed, would then give you essentially an unlimited 
number of tries at different initial conditions is, is the basic idea. And uh, as Father Spitzer pointed out, the board goth lenkin theorem applies to that. Uh, that can't extend eternally into the past. There had to be an initial bubble uh, because the average Hubble expansion is greater than zero. And uh, a con as a consequence, even a multiverse that's inflationary in this sense has a beginning. And if it has a beginning, it requires a transcendent cause. But does inflation um, solve the problem of initial condition fine-tuning? Well, no, not exactly. Uh, in fact, it makes it worse in at least a couple of ways. The first way in which it makes it worse, um, it was invoked to explain the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is uniform to uh, one part in about 100,000.